Okay, so I've actually been working since 1985 and often collaboratively with another artist called Janet Birchall. We initially had our own um, solo practices. So unfortunately, you're going to have to sit through a lot of earlier stuff. I've tried to make it coherent. So I, I'll have to put some earlier stuff to try and lead up to why I am now at the Tapestry Workshop. Another thing I might just say is that Janet came from an art school in Sydney. I'd gone to art school for one year and really disliked it and left it and then did film and philosophy. So in a way, so we do have slightly different perspectives. The only reason I'm saying this is not to give my own personal history, but perhaps the way that I might approach the idea of objects in space perhaps like more like an ensemble or perhaps even like a filmic idea of mise-en-scene. So hence, this is why I've chosen this very first work. So this, is, this was an exhibition that Janet and I did in 2000 at the Queensland University Art Museum. And the idea of the exhibition was to have, because we had been working since 1985, to have a selection of some earlier works and some new works. So we decided to have um, three types of rooms for like new works and then other old works. So this was the first room, which is, called, which is as you can see, like pre-Paradise, sorry now. That is actually, that's the name of a play by uh, a filmmaker called Rainer Werner Fassbinder, which I'm sure a lot of people would know. So obviously he was, a, uh, he was a filmmaker I liked very much and also like his type of mise-en-scene. The, the sculptures in front of this are called Chairs for Reclining Bodies, and they're a type of direct translation of Marcel Breuer's famous icicle chair. Because we've been very interested in, we've been interested in, this is quite a hard thing to say, the formal language of modernism and modernity and also its operative or perhaps non-operative history. So perhaps what was interesting um, about people like um, the Bauhaus is that when an artist in 2000 would use it, or earlier, say in the 80s, it was almost as if it was doubled by this historical discourse it had. So there was like this interplay going on. So it's also, it was very much the formal beauty, but also like it sort of almost like doubled by this ghostly discourse because it obviously had quite utopian, quite social types of amb ambitions. So this was like our foyer, pre-Paradise, sorry now, it was the chairs for climbing bodies. This is our wall unit. So obviously Bauhaus is quite famous for its very, very beautiful wall unit. So this is called wall unit on origin of the world. So um, it's a type of ward unit and it's got bronze cast nests that we collected over a year, so it went down. So it's a little bit also like um, Magritte's large rose. That's the close-up of one of the um, cast nests. Then we did our chair room. So this is a drawing I did, I think, in something like 1991. And it's based on a postcard of Marcel, Marcel Breuer's um, children's chair that I got from the Bauhaus archives in Berlin when I visited it. Obviously, I thought the little chair was very beautiful. It's a little wooden kitty chair. So I translated it, scaled it up to slightly larger than a normal chair and used glass and wood. And it was in this room. So that is my scaled up version, which is, um, I think it's called, it's called a very imaginative title, chair. <laughs> and, and what is around it is a series of photos that we did. We lived in Berlin for six years, and when we first went to Berlin, there was a, um, a, a space where the Berlin Wall had run, and there was a Turkish family that lived across in the flats, and they built this beautiful garden in this space, which at that stage didn't have a definite legal status. So we, and they, they used the furniture from just across the road, which was the former east, because the people being evicted. So they had all this 80s furniture, etc. I mean, the people knew that they so we did this over. The, this photographic series we did over 18 months, but we sort of did it for six years. So I'll just show you a couple of the 
photos that were in it. Oops. So I was different months. So is that one? I mean, they did it with great care. It was a very beautiful sort of arrangement. They had a garden behind it. The, and a lot of close-up of actual of the materials of the, of the different pieces of furniture. It's all sort of different, like changing furniture arrangements. The next thing is from a show in 2008 that Janet and I did with the Melbourne painter Melinda Harper. I think Melinda's <coughs> had a residency. Melinda is um, a painter who's very interested in uh, early modernism, perhaps Greg Crowley, very much a colour type of person. So we actually approached Heidi a few years before this exhibition to ask if Janet and I had if we could use the whole space, the whole architectural space, to do a type of exhibition which we would curate ourselves of our own works and then look through their collection to put things on. We chose the Heidi, I mean, it's a very beautiful building, but in 2008 we chose that because it was a living and ex exhibiting space initially, but we found it particularly repellent the new types of very mega museum spaces that were being um, done. We just thought the scale was very beautiful, the rooms, and again we could work with different rooms. Mm -hmm. So we decided to do the piece in the front is an um, uh, X table, which is a work by Janet and I, and in the back is our, what we called our collaborative tapestry, and here it is. So we actually, this is based on, um, a com this is like a combination of all our works together. So we actually did approach the tapestry workshop in 2008 <laughs> for a quote on, I'll just go, oh no, sorry, to go back, um, on this montage that we had, but it was $130,000. So we thought we would do what we call an experimental tapestry. So that was the experimental tapestry. So we all we did this sort of work together. So this was based initially on a combination of this work. This is a work by Janet and I. So obviously it's a neon, and all that rises must converge is based on um, a short story by um, I've got Flannery O'Connor, and it's <coughs> normally every it, we changed it from everything that rises must converge because it wouldn't fit <laughs> right to this. <coughs> And then I did this montage, combining our works and putting in negative. And that's what we'd actually approached the tapestry workshop for. It's been gorgeous. <laughs> but it was much too expensive. We <laughs> thought it would have been gorgeous too. <laughs> um, that X table, the table that's in the Heidi exhibition, this is it, um, the X table in another location. And the work on top is not ours, it's by a Brisbane artist called Paul Byron. It's called Return to Aesthetic Value. I think it's a great work. It's like a just a um, that thing that's in a supermarket and a, a raised ruler. This was the first table because we've done a lot of furniture sculptures. This is the first table sculpture we did in 2006 for Adelaide Biennale, and it's um, Barbara Hepworth's table. So well, people may know Barbara Hepworth. She's quite famous for the prior to Henry Moore. It's a big story about that. <laughs> um, this is another room from the Heidi exhibition. In it, we have two of what we call our shields. So it's a shields with some um, series, like sculptural series, that we started in 2004 that we envisaged as an ongoing series that could be a type of sculptural collage. So for the Heidi exhibition, we went through the archives and I chose Erica McGilchrist, who's a great Australian modernist artist really and that's one of her frottages and that's on our shelving unit. <laughs> so we have a shelving unit thing that you put different things on. Uh, that was a conversation kit. So it was a scan series so we basically used, we based it on um, Clement Meadmore's 20th century chairs. Clement Meadmore's an Australian sculptor and then we put with it very short extracts of text that we actually really liked. So it was not a deconstruction of the actual chair in that sense. It was a text we thought would go with the actual types of chairs in it. That's Gita Ball, obviously with the standard office chair. And that's, ooh, this is my favourite writer, Jane Bowles. And that could be my motto. I don't know if people can read those. Mm -hmm. 
Can you read it? Can you read it? No. Read it? no. Oh, I should know this. <laughs> it is against my entire code, but then I have never been able to use my code, although I judge everything by it. <laughs> <laughs> so that is my motto. <laughs> Uh, now I just want to get more into some of like the shields, I think. So that was, I think, Art Bell of New South Wales with a neon, and the hanging neon is, as I, as I said at the beginning, is that we have these ongoing series. So this is, in, we call this Interpretation of Dreams Neon. And these were the first two shields we did, right shield and the large mirror shield, which reflects, obviously, the room and the audience. So it just goes through the different shields. They're fairly self-evident. So they're curved. So some of them we made ourselves and some of them were made by a carpenter. Ooh. Mirror shield, which we often put, if we have an assemblage of different shields, we'll put that straight in the middle because it reflects everyone in it, like a parabola. Mm. <coughs> that was at the MCA in 2005. These are just various couples because that's actually the top one is like uh, metal and it's polyurethane and for people who know a little bit about American modernism it's obviously based on Ellsworth Kelly. So there's sort of like emblems and lozenges and shields. The other Ellsworth Kelly? Mm -hmm. That's my Max Ant cigar. This is a show I had in Melbourne in 2013. So um, it's pretty, you can sort of see it. On the other side. That was just, these are just closer ups of some of the pairings. That one is, I will comment on that one actually though. That one's called Oceania Communion. The hideous, the, the sort of touristy CD artifact uh, center, uh, thing in the middle was actually given to us by someone who, who had been living in Indonesia. So, and we'd had that for years. So we thought we'd put it, and I spoke before about like this type of sculptural collage that we put in all different types of material with the idea. And um, that the little circle is um, security razor wire, and then the defunct speakers. Okay, pretty evident. Um, hacker mask, so these just ones. That's, um, that's aluminium, that's actually cast fungi, because I really love fungi. So that's um, perforated aluminium, like uh, shield or whatever. But I did do a lot of different fungi, but because they were so thin, they sort of dissolved, so it was a reduced fungi shield, unfortunately. That's at Melbourne now. So again, you see sort of you sort of see the mirror. The mirror is always there. Oh, that's a solar neon that we did in two thousand and eight when we had a residency at this um, what used to be called Iaska in the wheat belt in Western Australia. Where about school? Um, Calibaran. Oh, yep, yep. So uh, Calibaran is like um, quite a specific small town, and we had six weeks, and we were very interested in actually trying to do a solar neon. So we thought we'd do that. That's the name of a Lynch film, which people would probably know. And it was, it was stra in a cartographic sense, it was incredibly stratified. You would have like, I, I sort of realized that there was a real spatial physicality to the turn other side of the tracks. Right. That was a little, we got sponsorship, a little mobile solar panels that they used to use for music festivals. So everyone was very nice. So mm -hmm. That's just another neon that figures later in some of the slides that we translated into something else. AK-47, which is pretty self-explanatory. Next thing we did, I uh, want to talk about, is an exhibition in 2005, uh, 2015, mm -hmm. at the Institute for Modern Art in Brisbane. Um, the title of the exhibition is called Imagining a Chord, and we did it on, we got the skip, and etc., and did it on the dumpster. We were actually invited, they had invited um, an Australian artist who lives in Berlin called Jerry Bibby. And Jerry had written a book that was published by Sternberg Press and the IMA. 
and he asked us to collaborate with him in this group exhibition called Imaginary Accord. So I guess some more there. The call into Imaginary Accord was what can institutions do? So we set up our own, there are obviously other artists, we set up our own circuit, so the end point was the skip. And they put the previous stuff in, and that was Kito Style. I don't know if people know this person, but... So we sort of did something a little bit about mobility. That's the inside, those are the old clunky walls that used to be in the IMA, which are actually really great, and they were on wheels. And we had these little things, with little TV things that we got from Kmart years and years ago. And Jerry's book, which is called The Drumhead, which you can get from World Food Books, he did a reading of it, and that was going through the um, speakers. So that's a view into our space, and that's a view into the bookshop. This is a, another shield, obviously, our flat shield, and that was in it, it's a 24-7 20, shield. In the exhibition, there's a book by an American writer called Jonathan Crary called 24-7, and it's about time. It, the book is about time. In the context of this exhibition, because a lot of it was with, between Jerry, Jan and I, there's a lot of reflection on neoliberalism in art institutions now and saturation, life saturation, all those dreadfully non-uplifting things. And I did this drawing, it, 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 which is based on like um, a number of, um, on Crazy Cat, this cartoon, which I'm sure most people are familiar with. And I guess there's a lot of different cells from it and put it all together. So we then, I, Janet and I then translated this into a <coughs> large neon wall work, which we had at Tarawara last year. This is the last <coughs> exhibition, um, this is our last sort of solo collaborative exhibition we had and that was last year um, at Neon Park in Brunswick. So the paintings are all along the side of the wall are actually, um, they use lines and poems from Emily Dickinson, a lot of colour. And, and for the central part we, you, we did four chair, um, car chair sculptures. So we reupholstered all the car chairs, basically, and put them in different stands. So that one is the uh, that's falling water one. So that's just a dye sublimation print, etc. And then that's then we cast we've got um, we cast we didn't con uh, cast it ourselves. We got this concrete cast with like these leaf imprints. And unfortunately, on the back you can't see it, but there's a large hole in it. It's also got like the wood texture, the classic way when it was first used, but which is yeah, concrete brute or whatever. That was a matching one. Falling water two. In the middle, we had, in a way, it's quite similar to the what we would call our shields, but I call them our screens, because the height is quite changed. It's a slightly like a room divider. It's an absolute conflation of public and private. It's extremely material and it uses a very reflective surfaces. These are like bicycle helmets, they're super reflective. <coughs> and extremely absorbent materials like the rolled up rubber. That's the front, it's like half an S bend. And that's the back. So dye this sort of thing next. And this is a, so I, we dyed, this was just found screen that we dyed. This is a project that we did um, just in that, from an exhibition in 2015 called, uh, it was called, uh, it was for the Mildura Palimpsest. I and Janet had been living in Mildura in 2014 because I, I have another degree as an ecologist and I was employed as a biodiversity officer. So while I was also there for a catchment management authority, I did weaving course with um, Claire Bates from the Murray Darling Green Time Weavers. And one of the, a lot, most of it was more like basket weaving, but one of the techniques was a very basic coil technique, which is sort of common to most weaving all around the world. So 
So for this Mildura Palimpsest exhibition, um, what we decided to do was take an area along the Murray and down into the central Mallee and basically do all the lakes. But we, it was like an, an idea of like a perpetual weaving project. Because I was living there, I could actually do it. So we'd actually, we would travel to the lakes and then I would do a type of weaving afterwards. Why I think I became so obsessed with this was because when I was at working as a biodiversity officer, I used to work with a lot of um, aerial photography and information system mapping, etc. So that that uh, that thing in the middle is actually a, um, a, a piece of private property which I had to map for various vegetation reasons. And the one to the right is my weaving sort of translation based on that. The one to the left is the end of my series, and that's the career. And these are just some close-ups of some of them. That's like two. And for each location, I had um, a carbon grid drawing that I would do on a plant. And that's sort of why I tried to do one of these sort of renditions when I first came to weaving workshop and realised it's pretty much impossible. <laughs> because it's all full of verticals and all lines. So that's sort of how I ended up here. Now I'm enjoying my residency, so that's it. <coughs> Thanks,